Hi everybody, I'm Michael Dunaway, and uh, you are witnessing one of the greatest moments in my life because I'm sitting <laughs> down with one of my filmmaking icons, the great John Sayles. Nice to is, be here. Who is here with his film, Go For Sisters, uh, which uh, we already know has a great cast and a great director, uh, but we haven't seen the film yet, but I'm mm -hmm. sure it's gonna be fantastic. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the film, preview it for us. Yeah, uh, Go For Sisters, the, the, the basic plot is two women who uh, grew up so tight they could go for sisters best of friends all the way through high school, lose touch with each other for 20 years, and are reunited when one of them is assigned to be the parole officer for the other who's just gotten out of jail fighting a drug habit. And then it takes off from there. Zaniness ensues. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, t talk to, we were talking in the back for a little bit about uh, some, of your, some of your great cast. Mm -hmm. uh, you got an opportunity to work with some fantastic actors like yeah. Edward James Olmos. And yeah, uh, uh, Lisa Gay Hamilton, who I'd worked with before on uh, Honey Tripper, Honey Dri uh, Dripper, who, uh, Gary Clark, your local uh, guitar whiz, uh, you know, that was his uh, first acting gig. A um, wonderful actress named uh, Yolanda Ross, okay. Edward James Olmos, um, and just, a, a, you know, as you see the movie, it's like, oh, I, I wish that guy would come back and do some more. So, so many good, you know, character actors. Um, uh, Jesse Borrego, who was uh, in uh, my movie Lone Star years ago, who's a wonderful actor. Um, so, you know, one of the, the, the nice things about a road movie is you stop every once in a while and you can, get a really good day player to come in, and Hector Alessandro is in it, wonderful yeah. in it. Always good to make them uh, leave the audience wanting more of that character. It's yeah. much better than the flip side of it. Yeah, you know, we have a three or four spin-off series. Um, you know, the, the character that Eddie plays is um, uh, an ex-LAPD detective who's had to, you know, not getting his pension because of some trouble when he had to leave the force, who's also, uh, he has macular degeneration, so he's starting not to see very well. So yeah. we're talking about the, the kind of Zatoichi blind samurai, you know, aspect of that. That could be a, a possible TV series. There you go. There's, multiple future projects mm -hmm. could be possible. One of the things I wanted to ask you about before we get to a couple of, uh, one of your other movies is that, uh, Many people might not know that you did three of the most iconic Bruce Springsteen mm -hmm. videos, uh, Glory Days, I'm on Fire, and Born in the USA. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to ask you about that is that all three of those songs have such a strong narrative voice. Listening to the song is almost like watching a little short movie. Mm -hmm. So what is it like? Is it intimidating or daunting to take something with that strong narrative voice and try to build a, a video around it? Well, well, first of all, it was right when Bruce Springsteen was starting to want to be in his own videos. I think, you know, one of his nieces said, you have to make a real video, you know, meaning you have to be in it and maybe play a character, not yourself. Yeah. Um, with uh, Born in the USA, Bruce just said, I want this to be gritty. I said, well, we do gritty. So, you know, we shot it in 16 millimeter. Um, we, you know, the concert part of it, because we shot all these kind of documentary images that I mixed into the, the cutting of it. Um, but, you know, the band doesn't want to play to a click track. You know, right. so we got them to, you know, Bruce wore at least the same clothes every night for four nights. And he came out and the first song was Born in the USA. So if you see the video, it's kind of rough synced. It's not exactly in sync in some places, uh, which is part of the roughness of it. Yeah. Um, the other two, really, the, you know, the story, the, the songs are stories. As, as you were saying, a lot of his songs are really like a movie. Yeah. Um, and really, Bruce came up with the ideas for the visuals. Mm. You know, I was really, it's the only time I've really worked as a director for hire. Yeah. Um, and then the joy of it was, of course, I also got to edit them. And I got to edit to a Bruce Springsteen song. <laughs> you know, what, what fun is that? Yeah. Um, and I would say the budgets weren't enormous, even by rock video standards. You know, they were, they were fairly modest, but I'd never had that much money to make three minutes yeah. ever, you know, <laughs> in my life and have a crane and two cinematographers instead of one and those guys. So they were really fun. And, and the people, he and the people around him were really good people to work with. Um, but it, it, it is a problem sometimes, uh, and you see this in rock videos, when the, there's a strong narrative in the, in the song itself and they choose not to just illustrate that narrative. Yep. You know, yep. you get a real kind of you know, clash of, of image and story and where's this thing going? Yeah, yeah. And actually that ties into uh, something we were talking about before about in, act, in films, using, you know, we're here in the Sennheiser lounge mm. talking about sound, right? Is that and a having, Sennheiser mic? It is, it is indeed. It happens to be. How'd you get uh, one? <laughs> um, and 
we were talking about how it's so important to get the right song or the right score or the right sound design for me. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about sort of your experience with sound in film and and Yeah, you know it's alchemy. Um, you you may rate it, you know, I've written and then this song plays while this is going on on the screen and you get in the editing room and you put them together and it just doesn't work, you know. The song may overpower the scene, it may drag on the scene, the you know, even if you cut to the song, there might be something wrong with the rhythm. Uh, but every once in a while, the alchemy is perfect. There's a, the, the fa- and I've done this a couple times, a famous example of William Friedkin uh, taking a Santana song and cutting that great you know, chase scene in the French connection to it yeah. and then taking the song out and putting new music in. Yeah. I did that in a movie called um, Baby It's You where I cut this confrontation between a kid and the vice principal to don't mess with Bill. Um, and then it was, when I watched it, it was just two on the nose. Two on the nose. I took the song out but the rhythm of the the cutting was still there. Yeah. So yeah. so it's almost you know it's still informed by that song. Yeah. So you do a lot of trial and error and then every once in a while it just lifts the scene up. Yeah. And you know so you 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 know you kind of go to your usual suspects or your ideas and if they don't work out you just start throwing things in there and hope that they're public domain. Yeah. So yeah. you can afford them. Well, um, last question uh, I think two of the th- as a filmmaker myself mm-hmm. I think two of the things that that inspire me so much about you as a filmmaker. One is, uh, the, you talked before about how that was your first time being a director for hire, mm-hmm. right? And your sort of fierce individuality and indiness that you have held to, and the, mm-hmm. and the independence that comes from that is really, is really inspiring. It reminds mm-hmm. me a lot of uh, uh, Richard Linklater, mm-hmm. who of course you, the two of you are kind of connected in, mm-hmm. in, in, in some ways with the emergence of the modern indie film movement. But the other thing is, and it's connected uh, to that as well is your w- determination to tell stories that matter and tell mm-hmm. stories that need to be told and maybe the most uh, illustrative <laughs> version of that mm-hmm. is uh, my favorite of your films which is Mate One mm-hmm. um, a story that too few people knew before you made the film mm-hmm. and many more people knew after mm-hmm. so uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what that meant to the community in West Virginia to have that story told. Yeah, that, it was an interesting thing. Is is, is people had some trepidation. Uh, we we went in there shortly after um, uh, uh, Deliverance, and they said this isn't going to be one of those movies about how we're all inbred, is it? You know, and we said no. Actually, this is based on some history that happened you know a couple counties over. And oh, the Mate One massacre. And there was even some trepidation about that. Um, and one of the things that we often do is we hire local people to be in the movie, to work on the movie. We've got a, a lot of wonderful carpenters. Mm-hmm. One guy walked two miles down the railroad track to the little town that we, we shot in to, to work on the art department. Uh, people already have the accent. They understand the story. So we had probably 20, 25 speaking parts who were just local people. And we also you know, gave the script out to some local people so that you know there's going to be gossip around the film, you'd like it to be based on something real. And so um, the people would say, well, other than the accent, you know, people don't have accents here, you know, that thick, you know. Um, It's pretty good, you know. When the film came out and we we went back to the uh, Thurmond and and Beckley area where we had shot it and showed it, um, people were really excited just because they felt like we've been ignored or it's only the Hatfields and McCoys, and that's not even very accurate. Uh, We had a fellow named Frank Price who uh, had a small part in the film, and he'd been a miner, and he had miner's asthma, he had black lung, and so he couldn't (sighs) quite get through a sentence without a couple deep breaths. And he said, you know, people have been coming here and taking their coal and taking things away and taking things away, and you're the first people who brought anything back. You know, and that meant a lot. It was, it was, um, and still to this day, it's something that um, in West Virginia you can buy the movie in hardware stores. You know, it's it, it's it's become part of how people define themselves. Of I'm from West Virginia. Did you ever see the the movie Mate One? Which is great. You know, that 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 a movie about one little incident can can somehow help people with their own identity and and, and part of how they explain themselves to the world. Wow, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Bruce Springsteen did that for a lot of people from New Jersey. Absolutely. You know, there you go. It's like, you know, it's like all, all around the world. You can be in Australia or Timbuktu and you say New Jersey and they go, Bruce Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
thank you so much for joining us. It's thank really you. it's really been an honor.